this episode of Ice Pilots. Buffalo springs into action when disaster strikes Haiti. There's a lot of suffering down there. Chuck clashes with the pilots when he tackles a problem his way. Don't with Chuck. And Audrey returns, but lands in the hot seat beside Joe. We're way up. Airways, they're scrambling to free a snowbound cargo plane from its cold storage. It's been on ice since work dried up six months ago. But today, Buffalo got a call about a catastrophe almost 6,000 kilometers away. As most of the population of planet Earth knows that there was a, a massive earthquake in Haiti, and we really thought we're out of the scope of being able to help. An aviation contact in Miami sent an SOS to Buffalo to help in the relief effort. Buffalo has sturdy warplanes and cargo haulers that can land on almost any airstrip. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. We're we're just a little green airline, and uh, we're we're invited to the big uh, the big show. But the ideal plane is nowhere near ready to fly. This stuff always happens when you have a major like an earthquake like that. Everybody's phoning everybody for an airplane. The plan is for Buffalo to fly to Miami and then shuttle relief supplies from there 1,100 kilometers across the Caribbean Sea to Port-au-Prince, Haiti, for as many weeks as it takes. This is completely out of our normal envelope of operations. We got to be very, very flexible and, and do what is needed at that time. And the first step is getting the L-188 Lockheed Electra out of its frigid parking spot. We should have never shut it down. The Electra's chief engineer, Chuck Adams, has to check all the components on this plane in record time. I just shoved this off a week ago. Chuck knows every bolt and rivet on Buffalo's most modern plane. The 50-year-old four-engine turboprop Electra is loaded with electronic features not found on Buffalo's older radial engine planes. You don't learn it overnight. It took me about 10 years before I actually really knew the airplane quite well. On the surface, Chuck is very uh, abrasive and uh, very uh, colorful. Some people get offended. Well, too bad. They should worry about what's going on in the world, not what Chuck's saying. But when it gets down to fixing things on a budget, Chuck is one of the best in the world. I think I want to try and back this out of here today, just to see if I can. But the Electra is in no hurry to go anywhere. Its wheels are frozen square and refusing to budge. Frozen to the ground. Chucky! Chuck calls for extra power and lines up for round two. Finally, the Electra lurches forward. Oh, oh, oh. They've smacked the wing right into the side of the hangar. This fender bender has left a minor dent. Forward! And it's a delay they just don't need. Because now, the real job begins. After months buried in the snow, every major system has to be inspected and brought up to spec to get the Electra fit to handle the relief mission to Haiti. The call Electra, it's an electrical nightmare. Look at this shit. There's wires hanging everywhere. The Electra went into service as a mid-range passenger liner in 1959. Its turboprop engines use gas turbines to drive the propellers. 
the same kind of turbine that creates propulsion in a jet engine. By the mid-1960s, those more advanced jets had taken over passenger travel. The Electra was out of date after just a few years in service. Production ended, and the Electra's brief heyday was over. But at Buffalo, it's the most modern and fastest plane in the fleet. Pressurized, it can fly at higher altitudes, where thinner air offers less resistance. Hey. Right now, Buffalo needs to get an Electra crew up to speed. OK, we're going to, I guess we're going to do the big shuffle here. Enter former Buffalo Electra captain Brian Harrison. Well, we're just getting the guys organized. Uh, we're going to move the C-46, we're going to move the DC-3, then we're going to pull the Electra out. He's up from his home in Edmonton to retrain the flight crew, because there's no one at Buffalo with an up-to-date Electra license. Like we have to do recurrent training every six months. We've got to do an instrument ride and a, and a pilot proficiency ride every year, and our time is up. I wanted to do this training a long time ago, because like, this is what happens. Stuff comes up, and then nobody's current. What? With no electric jobs in the last six months, Joe hasn't kept the pilot certified to fly it, because training runs cost big money. The airplane burns about 2,500 liters an hour. And I think the fuel cost here is around $1.70 a liter for turbo fuel. So that means we're burning uh, 40, you know, pretty near $4,500 an hour. You know, it's inflow, outflow. If you shit more than you eat, you'll shit yourself to death. So be sure you got lots of flow coming in. Now that there is finally some potential cash flow, Brian needs to get the crew ready. He's just back from a four-month contract flying jetliners in Saudi Arabia. Sure doesn't look like a 747. The world is, is much different, you know, 747, you wear a uniform and you walk on the airplane and uh, it gets loaded for you and unloaded for you and uh, this, it's a little bit different world. You uh, do just about everything that has to be done to get the airplane going. I've flown this an awful lot, so it's kind of like riding a bicycle. <laughs> but only if the Electra is fit to fly. And that's what they're about to find out. Once the electric is ready, then we're going to see if we can try to get uh, the electric down for this uh, humanitarian work into Haiti. The crew does a complete system check. Start number four, please. Been cleared to the, the ice pad, is that correct? Yes. They taxi out to where they can run up the plane's engines at full throttle to make sure she's ready to fly. The brakes are set. OK, all right, so mid horsepower number four was what? If everything checks out with the plane, they'll start retraining the crew tomorrow so they can be in Haiti as soon as possible. Shaft horsepower calculate. 3650. Torque rise. Retard power lever until RPM reaches 13820. OK, full reverse and fuel pull and we're done. Pretty awesome for sitting there out for so long. The verdict is in. The Electra is in excellent shape. Actually, I'd go do triple it right now and not think twice about it. Oh, yeah. But Brian's about to get a nasty surprise, a problem that no mechanic can fix. <laughs> 5 a.m. at the Buffalo Hangar in Hay River. 200 kilometers southwest of Yellowknife, and winter is unleashing her worst. It's no one's idea of a perfect first day on the job. Ugly conditions for Buffalo's newest rampy, Richard Adams, straight out of Alberta and eight feet up on an icy wing. Harden him up the first day. It'll be good for him. Build character. A rampy's life is all about backbreaking grunt work, prepping planes, hauling baggage, and making deliveries in wicked cold temperatures. But Richard's baptism by blizzard is good news to senior Hay River Rampy, Chris Matheson. Uh, that's a little bit gnarly, like I told him, hey, Richard? <laughs> yeah. After slogging it out here for three of the coldest months of the year, Chris is next in line to move across the lake to Yellowknife, where Rampy can actually get a shot at flying. Justin, who's flying the sked uh, this week, came over and approached me and uh, told me some good news. He said, hey, you know what, Chris? Uh, you're moving up to Yellowknife. <laughs> and uh, you know what else? <laughs> you got about a week to figure it out. <laughs> 
Chris needs to make sure the new guy is trained to shoulder his share of the load before moving on, and hopefully up. So you can, if you pull back just a little bit, it'll go like millimeters at a time. Looking good, Richard. Good, you're through. The last thing you want to do is put the forks to the side of Joe's plane. <laughs> you did good. I'm impressed. But 2,000 kilometers away, there's a wild card headed straight for Yellowknife. Audrey Marchand is on her way back to Buffalo, and that could scuttle the plans of rampies like Chris, who hope to be moving up the ranks. I went back home for about three months, and uh, now I'm back, back to Buffalo again. Audrey was one of the hardest workers on the ramp last year. The reason you're here is to learn, and it's strictly up to you. And she was one of Buffalo Joe's favorite employees. But some people thought she had an unfair advantage in the rampy rally to move up to a pilot job. If there's anybody who's going to jump somebody in line, it's a girl. Back in the fall, Audrey returned to Quebec for the birth of her new baby sister. Well, my mom had kind of um, a health problem and my sister too. The other rampies thought Audrey was gone for good. Now there's fear that she might jump them in line. Like, if I come back and I'm checked out pretty much right away, for me, it's fair. But I will understand that for them, it's kind of unfair, and I know that they will have a hard time dealing with that. It has to be fair for everybody, but it has to be fair for me first. With Audrey heading back to the Buffalo Ram, Chris and the other Rampies could all be stuck. Keep it going. In Yellowknife, Chuck and his electro protege, Adam Smith, are tracking down some minor problems from yesterday's test. Until everything is working perfectly on the plane, it can't fly to Haiti to help in the relief effort. I see what all this crap looks like. But sometimes, small problems can be the worst kind. From a mechanical perspective, it's not too bad so far. This, from an this airplane is a lot more challenging than the old ones, I'll tell you that. From an electrical perspective, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. <laughs> Replacing one faulty gauge see. is taking all day. It's got 40 year old wires in the thing now, and they're all getting old and brittle. So every time you move one little thing, whole, like three or four more things break. There's another broken wire right there. Chuck, as a teacher, is a phenomenal person to learn from. He's got a lot of experience. He's got semi-can-do attitude. There's more wire in here than I got pubic hairs. <laughs> All Joe wants is to hey, join Justin. in the relief effort in Haiti. Have you seen yeah. Ernie? But he's hit a major snag. Are, are you OK to, to train, or is there I'll a problem? Who said that? Dave Smith. He's just sending me an email now. He says, because I didn't do a loft in November, that my PPC is not valid. Give me his phone number. Well, he Simply put, Brian is missing a single one-hour training session. That makes his electro license as expired as everyone else's. Yeah, hi, it's Joe McBrien, Buffalo Yellowknife. Well, I'm trying to find out from the horse's mouth why Brian can't train my crew, because it appears he's missed some uh, six-month, one-hour something. Oh, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Well, wave it. But government regulator Transport Canada isn't budging. Without Brian to train the crew, the entire mission to Haiti could be over before it even begins. Frustrating. That's just the word, way to put it. Recurrency. I do not have, at this minute, a training captain to train anybody. So I would suggest that we put everything on hold and we all go home, put the airplane back in the snowbank until I figure this out. A new day at Buffalo. The Electra is ready to go. It's been called to help airlift supplies to the millions of people suffering from a devastating earthquake in Haiti. I don't know whether we should tolerate that or not. Oh. A good engineer would have had that clean. Good time to be up in that outfit, too. Yeah, the airplane's ready now. 
but there are still several issues to resolve. There's paperwork, there's uh, customs, there's, you're, you're dealing with three different countries. You got Canada, you got US, and you got Haiti. Uh, so there's a lot of ducks you had to have in your row. And the biggest obstacle is getting the Electra crew recertified right away. Fortunately, a pilot who can do the Electra proficiency rides has been found. The standard uh, IFR maneuvers, holds and approaches, and then we'll uh, integrate some the basic emergency procedures in there as well, engine failures, engine fires, all simulated, of course, just for uh, crew training purposes. It will take a few days of flying to recertify. Clear on one when you're ready. Before the Electra crew can take off from Miami to join the Haiti relief effort. Then, oh really? News from Miami: the Haiti contract is dead. Okay, is there uh, is there anything we can do to? Uh... A major disappointment for Mikey. Well, thank you, and uh, good luck with everything, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Bye. Well, we just received a phone call uh, from the, the people that are organizing the relief effort for Haiti. And uh, as it turns out right now, they, they're up to their capacity of, of, of aircraft. They basically, every available aircraft in the world is technically there. We were uh, pushed to the back of the line. And uh, so we missed out on this one, which is kind of sucks. It could have been a huge contract in a stone-cold economy. Now, Buffalo's invested in the training, and there's no payoff in sight. 15, 14, 13. Early the next morning, Ramp Hand and aspiring Buffalo pilot Audrey Marchand arrives to a warm Buffalo welcome. How are you doing, sir? Welcome back. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fellow rampy Chris Matheson had barely arrived at Buffalo last fall when Audrey left for home. Good morning, John. Now, she'll be tough competition for him yeah. and for fellow rampy John Martin. I, I know you're French, so you're on. But those who are already Buffalo pilots and outside the rampy rivalry are just happy to see her. Good, good. Welcome back. Audrey's a happy, very upbeat person. It's Monday morning, a lot earlier than I'd like to be awake, and uh, she's here and just has her little infectious charm to her and puts a smile on everybody's face. We missed you. Did you? We did, you little shit. <laughs> Bubbly little thing bouncing around all the time. Yeah, that was a really good day. But in rampy politics, the opinion that really matters belongs to the guy flying the sked, the daily scheduled passenger flight from Hay River. Hey. Good morning, Joe. How are you? Good, good. Stay back. <laughs> Sometimes you end up shrouded by a bunch of whiners and crabbers and bitchers. It's always nice to have one that, um, that that has a natural smile and, and a laugh. Welcome home. Thank you. Giving me a hug and telling me that he's happy that I'm back. Well, for me, it means a lot. <laughs> but her return won't be good news for everybody. Later that morning, the Electra pilot proficiency rides continue. Even though there's no rush now, Joe decides to finish the training. But it's costing him. $4,500 an hour in fuel alone. But Mikey might have found a way to make all that training pay off in the nick of time. If they're done training, uh, I got a customer, uh, none of it power, and they need a trip to Cambridge Bay, which will help offset the cost of training. During the Cold War, Cambridge Bay on Victoria Island was the site of a distant early warning line radar station. New line. It became a system set up to protect North America from possible Soviet attack across the North Pole. Men had to conquer that unknown frozen wasteland and transform it into a vital outpost of Western civilization. Most dew line stations in Canada shut down in 1985. Only Cambridge Bay and seven others were transformed into part of the new, smaller North Warning System. 
It provides airspace surveillance of Canada's northern border. Today, this outpost of 1,500 souls needs a massive piece of equipment called a heat exchanger to keep the generators cool in the town's main power station. Uh, yeah, if the big one fits, you get the trip. The airplanes we have, the doors are on the side. So that means when an object goes in, it also has to turn a corner. So this thing was basically at the limits of the electric. Uh, that's over six feet tall now. We can take those off. And the door is 16. If the piece doesn't fit, we don't get the trip, which means that we're going to have to do the right of shame and take all the equipment with our forklift down, down the first air so it can go on the hurt. The competition's Hercules loads from behind and can take the cargo straight in. Buffalo can't afford to lose this contract. Forty-something thousand dollar trip. We had to make that trip. Keep Joe happy. Got to try. Got to make do. If you don't try, it ain't going to work now, is it, eh, little brother? When the Electra rolls in, Chuck will have to make the heat exchanger fit somehow. Any chainsaws? After spending thousands of dollars to recertify the Electra crew for a relief mission to Haiti that didn't end up happening, so, yeah, Cambridge, Cambridge. Buffalo has lined up a contract that will cover their training costs, and then some. We got a unit that has to get to Cambridge Bay. Uh, the good news is we have a trip. Uh, the bad news is we might not know if this piece fits. But if the 3,500-pound heat exchanger doesn't fit on the Electra, Buffalo will lose the contract. We should be able to get this in this way it is without that skid. But it's going to be tight with that link. Right away, Electra captain Ray Weber has big doubts. It's going to be damn close. At over 12 feet long and 6 feet wide, the heat exchanger is almost beyond the dimensions of the Electra's cargo door. There's only one way to tell for sure if it'll fit. Buffalo's motto is, we got to try. Keep coming. OK, hang on. Oh, oh, oh. oh that's close, man. I don't know if that's going to fit. That's going to be one. Tight squeeze. Keep coming. Hold it. Take it up. Oh, no. Well, first attempt, we got it in the door. But there was no way in hell we were going to turn the thing to get it go down. Even Buffalo's hardest-headed mechanic, Chuck Adams, has to admit defeat. I don't think we're going to get her in, buddy. Myself. The way it's looking, they'll have to take the load to the competition. And the Electra back to the snowbank. Okay. Meanwhile, Audrey Marchand's first day back keeps getting better. Yeah. After missing three months of winter work. Back home, you scared. That's great. Audrey is just picking up where she left off. As flight attendant on the sketch. Oh, it may be just flight attending, but she's working on the plane her first day back. And fellow rampies Chris and John know what that means. Hey, you get to go for a ride? Yep, for Oh, man. She's already jumped ahead of them. Obviously, like, it's going to knock you down a bit if someone gets checked out ahead of you. But I'm just hoping to get checked out by summertime. So while they do the hard work on the ground, Audrey will be on the DC-3 with Buffalo Joe. Flight attending is one step away from every Rampy's dream, a co-pilot job. And it seems that Audrey has regained her seniority despite leaving the company last fall. And Joe hasn't lost his confidence in her. She no doubt can fly an airplane, and that, that's pretty well straight and level. I'll just have her in there just to familiarize herself where everything is. For the Rampy's left behind, all they can do is keep working. I think they still don't really agree about me coming back, and they're kind of a little jealous. 
they're not gonna show like what they feel and they're not gonna talk to me about it because that's how guys act. So it's not my problem. While her work now isn't up front in the cockpit, it could lead to her flight training directly with Joe. Graham Ferguson has already passed that point. He and Andrew Vike were checked out as DC-3 co-pilots while Audrey was away. Now Audrey is intent on catching up. As Joe said, being checked out at Buffalo is like a hockey game. You have to fight for it. After a 50-minute flight across Great Slave Lake, Audrey and the DC-3 roll into Hay River Airport. On her way to the Buffalo Staff House for the night, Audrey is on top of the world. I'm really happy to be back, actually. Everybody's been so good to me today. So it's gonna happen. It's been the perfect first day. Back at the Yellowknife hangar, Chuck is still trying to salvage the Electra mission to Cambridge Bay. He's come up with a radical solution. There's only one way this is going on the airplane. That's if we split it in half. Because we're trying to put a big square box in a little round hole, it ain't gonna happen. The heat exchanger is perfectly designed for just that option. Two completely separate pieces. Okay, yeah, it's perfect. Comes with the, the radiator on the bottom and the two electrical fans to blow the air through the radiator like in your car. Pieces that should be simple to split apart. Oh, there's 46 bolts all the way around. This is the fan side. See, there's two big fans up there. We split it right here. I don't think 46 bolts should stop 46 grand from coming in the door. They need to convince Mikey so he can get permission from the client. It's in 50 inches. Is the sweet spot. I kind of gathered that yesterday, brother. I had to think about all this last night, eh? Chuck's gut tells him his plan will provide just enough clearance, but Electric Captain Ray Weber's calculations cast serious doubts. 51 inches is about here, mm -hmm. and that's where the bulge of the airplane is at its greatest. Yeah, so that's the so that's sweet where spot. It's gonna, that's where it's going to run into it, is at that greatest home. We had two sides. We had the mechanics versus the pilots. The mechanic, uh, head of the mechanics was Chuck, head of the pilots was Ray. Ray said it wouldn't fit, Chuck said it would fit. I was on the fence. I, even though I was saying it was going to fit, I had no clue. This is a 13 foot one and plus a little bit for clearances because you're not taking chunks off the airplane. So what you do is you lay a diagonal across here like that and then you measure from here to here. And that comes out to just under 70 inches. Why, uh, Jesus Christ, all the brains walked in. Total cluster now. Even though Chuck is sure he can make the piece fit, Ray's loading graph says it won't. Everybody's going with the computers. Now, I do ask you a question. Did they have them in the 50s? How in the hell did they load these planes in the 60s with no computers? OK, but well, that's what we were looking at, that if it was more than 10 feet long, it couldn't be this wide and go in the door. You have to look at that graph. Too many gigabytes, man. Everybody's all fed up in that shit, you know? Chuck was using his gut and saying it's going to fit. So who's right, a graph or your gut? I bet on the gut. Jesus Christ, what kind of f***ing junk do you Yeah, I get us an air wrench. Jesus Christ, well, let's get up to date here. Mikey needs Chuck's gut to be right, or else Buffalo will lose the contract. Tomorrow morning, He'll find out if Chuck's $46,000 hunch will pay off. A new morning on the Yellowknife ramp and a last chance to save the big electric contract, hauling 20,000 pounds of cargo to Cambridge Bay. The problem, the biggest piece, a 3,500-pound heat exchanger doesn't fit on the plane. Chuck's plan, split the huge piece in half to get it through the door. I'll take full responsibility. But will it work? Yeah, if she doesn't fit, we don't get the trip. That simple. If the bottom fits, the top should too. But the numbers say that the bottom at over 6 by 12 feet is still too big. Ray didn't think it was going to fit. Co-pilot, I think Sean, he didn't think it was going to fit. 
The flight engineer was, was Luby. He didn't think it was going to fit. Nobody thought it was going to fit. But Chuck's gut thinks different. OK. Come on in. He coming. Yeah. He coming. He coming. OK. And with the Electra, getting too close is a big, big problem. See, this is the whole problem with this airplane. DC-4, you can hit it, do a little damage, and get away with that. But you can't with this airplane, because you're pressurized. OK, hold it, hold it. With this thing, any nick and scratch uh, is considered very bad for the structure of the aircraft. I guarantee you it's going to go in, man. OK, we're just about there. Just don't touch the airplane. Easy, good. More, keep her coming, keep her coming. They've got the load through the doorway. Now comes the tricky part. If we could turn the corner, we're laughing. If not, we're uh, we're crying. So we're, it's a game of inches, and we only have a few left, so. OK, hang on. You need side shift over there. Side shift back. Millimeters at a time, they try to turn the cargo. Too rough and they could punch a hole right through the fuselage. Once it gets around, it just starts to go around the corner. If it doesn't make it around that corner, you'll never get it in. OK, where are we, Sean? I'm on the pallet now. We can just pull it over with that now. Oh, OK. You coming? Before, hold it. Hold it right hold there, Hold it. Chuck. Hold it. Might be right here now. OK, there. OK. So we just tried and kept trying. Keep her coming. Coming. Okay, good. It's in. Hey. Woo. Let's push her, boys. With the bottom half of the heat exchanger in the Electra, Chuck turns his attention to the top half. Let's push this in half. Let's get out. We need a hand here. To get the top part of the heat exchanger on board more easily, Chuck decides to split it in two as well. Chuck would have came up to me and said, hey, Mikey, this thing is not going to fit. I would have called the customer right there and said, sorry, it won't fit in our airplane. But luckily, Chuck didn't say that. Chuck says, you know what, Mikey, bleep, 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 we'll get this thing in. No, well, what just happened? I just pulled the impossible with everybody going fucking blah, blah, blah. It can't be done. Well, it's in there, ain't it? Brother. The thing about Chuck is, don't f with the Chuck. With all the cargo in the plane, the Electra is ready to head to Cambridge Bay tomorrow. Later that afternoon on the Yellowknife tarmac, one of Buffalo's DC-3s is set to take off. Joe needs an extra plane in Hay River to transport freight in the morning. And that's good news for Audrey. Okay, once you get everything done, trade seats with Audrey, I'll give her to take off and get her. Joe's not wasting any time getting Audrey back up to speed. He's giving her a training run as co-pilot. Audrey's eager, but rusty. She's only flown the DC-3 a handful of times. And that was months ago before she went home. OK, I'll talk you through it. You're done take off with me before, haven't you? Yeah, I did talk to you have to know like a whole bunch of different things because in case of an emergency, you don't have time to take a look at your book. You have to know your stuff. She needs to remember that training now if she's going to impress Joe. I got everything done for you, so just roll up the throttle, one hand on the wheel, heels on the floor, right? Yep. gets to fly, official co-pilot Graham enjoys a rare chance to relax in the back of the plane. Oh, I'm feeling pretty happy. If Audrey can show Joe she hasn't forgotten her flight school training, she could cement her position as the next in line for a DC-3 co-pilot checkout. It's better when you're co-pilot. It's better, well, you enjoy a little bit more of your job when you fly, that's for sure. 
Notorious for being hard on his young co-pilots, Joe's taking a more gentle approach with Audrey. I didn't fly for three months, so yeah, being back on the DC-3, you have to feel like how strong you have to, yeah, push and pull and turn and press on the pedals and all that. You gotta kick it over. You turn that wheel, you gotta kick that pedal on the airplane, I'll just twist it. Yeah. You won't turn, no. Level away. But as they drop towards the Hay River runway, Audrey's in for a nasty surprise. Uh, the vertical visibility is still around 600 feet. Um, the visibility has dropped to about a mile and a half now. I guess this way I just moved in last couple hours. Actually, just within probably the last half hour here, it's dropped just like a stone, the visibility. They'll be approaching through a thick layer of blinding cloud. So just hold 120. Just hold 120. Audrey won't be able to see the runway until they're almost on top of it. Now, she must use the dashboard instruments to gauge her altitude, direction, and rate of descent. She's flying instrument flight rules, or IFR, and she's out of practice. When you are in the real IFR conditions and when it's your job to do it, it's really, really not the same feeling in the same condition as when you're doing training in flight school. Better go back to one trio. They taught that school, remember that? Yeah. Okay. So, two, three, zero. No, one three zero. Turn my way, one three zero now. See the needle coming in? We gotta get over there. See that? We gotta get on the localizer. Right now, the most important instrument is the localizer. Radio signals from the ground transmit the exact approach path to the runway. As long as the localizer needle lines up, they're aiming for a dead center landing. We gotta get back on that localizer. Got is it coming back yet? Out of practice, Audrey's having trouble lining up the localizer needle. A seasoned co-pilot would have no problem. We're going to miss it all together. We're at 1,000 now. Yeah, we'll get her down. They're about to hit the decision height, the point where they have to commit to a landing or overshoot and climb back up for another try. We're way up, and there's where at minimum. Let me see you barely here. Ah. We were not right in front of the runway, so we missed the runway. Okay, here's the lake, the highway, runway, on the guard. Okay. Just turn to 150 and keep on climbing. Okay. They climb back up and circle around for a second attempt. But this time, Joe isn't giving Audrey a second chance. I'll get to change out with, uh, Graham? yeah. Here we missed the approach. I gotta get on that look right Somewhere beneath the low cloud lies the shrouded Hay River runway. You're not coming back at all? Nope. After overshooting the runway on the first attempt, Buffalo Joe moves trainee Audrey out of the right seat and brings co pilot Graham back to the cockpit. We screwed up here. We missed the approach. Okay, just hold that hitting until we get on that low play. Roger. If you're driving only once every Sunday, you're going to be a lousy driver. You're a you know, Sunday driver. It's the same thing with flying. Hold that 270 until that runway comes in. Just hold that altitude. Roger. Tap the pedal a bit here aside once in a while. Okay, there's the localizer coming. I'll live with that. With Audrey looking on, Joe and Graham break through the clouds and slide the DC-3 right down the middle of the runway. A perfect landing in difficult conditions for a rookie. You're very welcome. Have a good one. Thank you. You're welcome. After the flight, Graham cuts Audrey some slack. Like when you're coming in on the approach, like there's the pod was a lot thicker. We're coming in right off the lake. Hey, there's no excuse. We missed it. We missed it. That's it. But Audrey's been reminded just how much she still has to learn. She has hours of hard work and simulator time ahead before she can move up that long aisle from the ramp to the cockpit. Oh, we're practice tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You get on that Good. sim. Yeah. I have to prove them like every day when I wake up that, yeah. 
I earned it and I have it and I'm gonna prove you tomorrow morning too that I deserve it. The next day in Yellowknife, the Electra revs up for a flight to Cambridge Bay with a giant piece of cargo on board that almost no one thought would fit. No one but mechanic Chuck Adams. P2, you're up. You're selected up 400 feet to be up. Left up, left selected up. Chuck is personally escorting the 3,500 pound heat exchanger to its destination. I want the trip just as bad too, but just get them guys flying. Yeah, we'll be in the uh, Bay at 13 or 12. It's 850 kilometers from Yellowknife to Cambridge Bay in Nunavut. That's just over two hours in the turboprop Electra. One way inside. Check. After all the doubts, it looks like they're going to get this job done. 30, 20, 10. They touch down. Cambridge Airport Radio Bus 11711. But the delivery is not yet complete because what went into the airplane... Is there a pair of cutters on the forklift? ...must come out. Unloading? Well, it was a pain in the ass. The biggest pain and biggest piece is saved for last. And they have to be very careful not to damage the Electra during the offload. Try tilting it up. Hang on. <laughs> it was a little bit harder coming out than it was going on, actually. Once again, it seems impossible. But by now, impossible is just part of the job. He said I wouldn't fit in the door, I wouldn't come in, just went out the door and came to me. Mission accomplished. Buffalo got the job done and Cambridge Bay and its important North Warning System station have a reliable source of power again. The moral of the story, she's just another day at Buffalo Airways, bro. Total chaos and mayhem. Entertainment has finest. The crew is finally on its way home, thanks to one stubborn mechanic. Take me home. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT, a brand new engine gushes oil. We saw half a gallon in three minutes. Grounding a major charter. Hey, Mike. This is bullshit. Buffalo leads a pack of athletes to the Arctic Winter Games. It's hard to see. And Devin tries to get home running on empty. Play on fields. 